Let's see, where's this go? Over here. There we go. Hello, here we are. Welcome back. I sent you all email this morning. Make sure you read it, please, so I don't worry so much. Um, we're going to start with um, a clicker question. But let me see if I can get this video to go. All right, the clicker question is based on the video, and then you get to choose which of these concepts is illustrated in the video. Let's see. I've never actually done a video successfully, so we're going to see how this works. No, how do I get the volume? Oh, probably. What well, doesn't matter? There. Can you see it? That makes sense. All right, so, whoops, back, previous. There we go, start the clicker. So, what concept was illustrated by that ad? I saw that on TV last night. I thought, oh, I just gotta bring that in. It's too exciting, too exciting. All right, three seconds. One, two, and three. I think it's that one. What was she doing, right? She likes the shoes, right? And she had that, yes! And she looked at them at several stores and they were too expensive and she finally got to the store where the price was below the willingness to pay. So that's an illustration of consumer surplus. The bunch of people answered price elasticity of demand. Shh, we're pretty much split between those two concepts. Price elasticity of demand, we really need a whole market. That was just one individual who was looking at what price she was willing to pay for a pair of boots that she really, really liked. But if we're going to talk about price elasticity of demand, we're talking about how a market, that is to say a whole lot more than just one person, uh, responds to changes in price. And so for price elasticity, we would have had to have that video played over and over and over and over and over and have different responses to different changes in the price to get some sort of aggregate for the economy as a whole. All right, let's try the next one. Next one, here we go. Which of these statements is correct when we're discussing the firm's supply decisions? Long run means generation to generation. Long run means enough time to change capital. Long run means two or three, or year, two or, three years or so. Long run doesn't have just one meeting. Uh-oh, and then there's E. When we're talking about firm supply decisions, what's the definition of long run? A, B, C, or D, or E, if you're so inclined. Three seconds. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. Find the stop button. 66% is better than 58, still making me a little nervous. One of the kickers in economics is the definition of the phrase long run has different definitions depending upon what topics we're talking about. So when we did the production possibilities frontier and we talked about economic growth, we talked about economic growth depending upon increases in the supplies of inputs and increases in the productivity of inputs. That's a discussion about long run growth, but it's really about generation to generation changes. So the difference over a decade or two decades or, or three decades. We're also going to talk about the long run in some context in terms of macro, where it's going to have yet another meaning. But when we talk about the supply side of a market, which is what we're starting on today, the supply, that upward sloping supply curve, when we're talking about the decisions that firms make about how much they want to supply to the market, in that case, the definition of long run is a period of time long enough so the firm can change the amount of capital, that is the amount of machines and buildings that it's using. So the definition when we're discussing firm supply decisions is B, that the long run means enough time to change capital. It's not a specific number of months or years. We'll look at that uh, in a few minutes. All right, one more. Yes, one more. Diminishing returns. The law of diminishing returns tells us A, the more inputs we add, the less output there is. B, obtaining more and then more and then more output requires a diminishing quantity of the variable input. C, obtaining more and then more and then more output requires an ever increasing quantity of the variable input. D, none of the above, and E is there for your entertainment. A, B, C, D, or E. Hmm. Three seconds. One, two, and three. Ow. This is why I'm nervous. That was the genesis of the email that I sent this morning. I really want to see those numbers up above 57%. Remember, the reading is something that you do before you come to class, whether or not there's a B courses quiz um, to enforce that requirement. All right, we're going to get back to that concept, and hopefully when you see that question again, we'll get above 57%. If not, I'll just stand up here and weep. What are we doing today? We're starting the supply side. So we've done several days now looking at the demand side of the economy, talking about consumer behavior, and now we need to turn and look at firm behavior and talk about the decisions that individual firms make in deciding how much they're going to produce. So the question we're asking, we're trying to get at, why does that supply curve slope up? Why does the supply should be the word curve in there, shouldn't there? Why does the supply curve slope up? Is the question that we're asking. Remember, I said everything has questions, simplifications, assumptions. The simplifications I didn't write down is we're going to talk about one firm and we don't really care what it produces. The assumptions are that the goal of the firm is to maximize profit. So the key assumption when we talk about supply is that the goal of the firm, the goal of the owners of the firm, is to maximize the amount of profit. So we need to start by talking about profit and the definitions of profit. Profit in general is the total revenue minus the total costs, evaluated over some time period, usually over a year. Total revenue we saw last time. Total revenue is price times quantity. Total costs. Here's the important piece when you're doing economics. Total costs includes first the standard out-of-pocket costs that you would include if you were taking an accounting class. So we call those the explicit costs or the accounting costs, things like paying your workers, buying supplies paying the rent and all that sort of thing. In addition, for an economist, the total cost costs include the implicit or opportunity costs. When we're calculating profit, we look not just at the accounting costs, but the opportunity costs as well to get the total economic costs of a firm. What are those opportunity costs? There's two sets that really matter. One is the opportunity cost of capital. Remember that capital means machines and buildings. And so here we're thinking about the money that you as a business owner, today you have to put yourself in the shoes of a business owner. So whenever I say you today, you are going to be a business owner. The opportunity cost of capital thinks about the money that you, a business owner, have put into purchasing your machines. So suppose that you're running some small company, you've got some machinery that you purchased, uh, and that machinery costs you $10,000. You, if you had not used your $10,000 to buy that machinery, you could have left your $10,000 in some sort of a savings account or bonds or something, some sort of financial instrument, and let's suppose that that financial instrument would have earned 5%. So if you hadn't taken the $10,000 and written a check and bought the machine, that, that $10,000 would still be in some account, and let's assume that account is earning 5%. The phrase normal rate of return refers to that interest rate that you could earn on the money if you hadn't used the money to buy the capital. So when we talk about what's the normal rate of return, I don't know why they call it normal. They do. It means what's your opportunity cost? What's the rate of return you could have earned on your money if you hadn't sunk that money into some machinery? In this case, we've got a normal rate of return of 5%. And so the implicit cost of your capital, that is the implicit cost of the machines that you've sunk your cash into, is 5% of that $10,000, or in dollar terms, $500. What it means is you've given up the opportunity to earn $500 interest income every year with that $10,000 that's now been used to buy some sort of machine for the business that you're running. Opportunity cost of capital. I should put down your time frame. This is per year because you get that 5% on an, annualized, on an annual basis. The second opportunity cost is the opportunity cost of our time. Time is money, as they say. Suppose that instead of running a business, you could work for somebody else. 
You could own your own business and spend your entire life running that business, or you could work for someone else. And suppose if you worked for somebody else, you could make $40,000. That's the opportunity cost of your time or your labor. So in this case, with this example, the opportunity cost of your labor would be $40,000. So we can use all this information to calculate both the accounting profit and the economic profit. Let's do this example. Suppose that you're running a business, your total annual revenue is $100,000. Your annual accounting cost, the cost you pay your workers and for your supplies and your rent and your insurance and all that good stuff, is $60,000. Your accounting profit just looks at those first two numbers. So your accounting profit looks at your revenue, price times quantity, and subtracts from that your accounting cost. So what's your accounting profit if this is your business? How much is your accounting profit? $40,000. So your accounting profit is your $100,000 in revenue minus the $60,000 in accounting costs for accounting profit of $40,000. Your economic profit looks not only at the accounting costs, but at the economic costs as well. So this is a company you've got $50,000 tied up in your company. You could have earned 10% if you had that money in some sort of savings instrument, and you could earn $40,000 working someplace else. I'll let you calculate the economic profit, and then click in A, B, C, D, or E. Walking, walking. Notice that all those options have the same answer for accounting profit because we just figured that out. This is something you should be able to do without a calculator. You can do 10% without a calculator. Just click in. You click. How many clicks? Oh, I only have 320 clicks. Let's get some more clicks in here. Hi, how are you? Hmm. Excuse me. Thank you. Can we do it in five? Let's say five seconds. One, two, three. Four, five. Work maker. Awesome. Oh, I love that it works maker. All right, let's see what we got. Awesome. What does that say? Ooh, 67%. I want it to be higher. B is the correct answer. 67%. I want that to be higher. But here we go. So we had, let me see my little red. Ooh, look at that. We had 100,000 in total revenue. We had 60,000 in accounting costs. The opportunity cost of your capital is how much? 5,000. 10% of 50,000 is 5,000. The opportunity cost of your time? 40,000. So you take 100 minus 60 minus 5 minus 40 gives you negative 5. So the economic profit in that case is a negative $5,000. The accounting profit, you always subtract from the accounting profit the opportunity cost of your time and your money. So let's try a question that you had on Monday. Which of these statements is true? Accounting profit is the same as economic profit. Accounting profit is always larger. Accounting and economic profit are different, but we don't know which one is larger. Accounting is always smaller or E. I don't know. People holding up the walls back here. Choose one. Okay. Ooh, we're getting up there. Three seconds. One, two, and three. Please, please, please be more than 50 some odd percent. 80! Yoo! All right. Making progress. Good. 80%. Get the happy face. Accounting profit is always larger than... Have your face. The accounting profit is always larger than economic profit because from the accounting profit, you subtract two other numbers, the opportunity cost of capital and the opportunity cost of time. And if you're going to take one number and subtract from it two other numbers, the first number better be bigger. It's just sort of one of those number line things running across. All right, uh, accounting profit is always larger than economic profit. Now, we look at economic profit when we are considering the decision-making of individual firms, and individual firms make a series of decisions. One decision that an owner of an individual firm makes is a long-run decision. Remember, long-run is a period of time long enough. One way of saying it is the technique can be changed. Another way of saying it is the capital. We use K to stand for capital. Can be changed. Same idea, just a different word. The capital or the technique can be changed. In the long run, by definition, entry into and exit out of the industry are possible. So the definition of the long run is a time period long enough so other people can enter that industry and start competing with existing firms, or existing firms can exit that industry. That's the definition of the long run. The decision that firms make in the long run is whether or not to exit the industry or to stay quit. So firms that are producing some output, the long run decision that they're always facing is do I stay in this industry or do I need to exit the industry? Exiting the industry means selling off all the equipment, getting out of all the contracts, exiting the industry. I'm going to close down this business and I'm not going to be involved in it anymore. I'm going to get out of my lease. I'm going to sell off the equipment. I'm going to cancel all my contracts. And I'm going to go work for George. I don't know who George is. I made that up. The short run decisions. Short run. The short run is a period of time during which the technique is fixed. Another way of saying it is the amount of capital is fixed. The number of machines, number of buildings are fixed and can't be changed in the short run. In the short run, entry into and exit out of the industry are impossible. That's the definition of the short run. It's a period of time short enough so that entry into and exit out of the industry are impossible. And if it's a firm that has decided to exit, so if it's a firm that's decided to exit the industry, I gotta get out of this industry, then the decision they need to make in the short run is whether to produce today or immediately shut down. That's the decision that's made in the short run. Four firms have decided to exit. The decision today in the short run is produce or shut down. And for the firms that are planning to stay and the firms that are planning to, to not shut down today, the decision they make is how much do we produce. Now we're gonna focus a lot today on this bottom line. For firms that are planning to stay in the industry or firms that are, are um, not shutting down but planning to exit, how much do they produce today? That's our focus today. On Monday, we're going to come back and look at this thing about shutdown and exit. Okay? So this is sort of a bottom-up outline. We're going to do the bottom thing first, how much to produce, and then Monday, we're going to look at that shutdown piece and the exiting versus staying in the industry piece. All right, cool? Ready, set? Not too cool, but the fans may be helping. I don't know. Oh, that's going to make it too loud. If the fans make it too loud, we'll have to compromise. All right. Here we go. Let's think about an individual firm. Now, I've been around Berkeley a long time. And the place that I go for frozen yogurt is Yogurt Park. I know, having gone into Yogurt Park, the demographics of Yogurt Land are people 25 and younger, and the demographics of, of Yogurt Park are people 40 and over. But stick with me here. It's what I got pictures of. So let's look at Yogurt Park. Yogurt Park's over there on Durant, in that little weird passageway that goes through to, to Bancroft. And it was the original frozen yogurt place in Berkeley. It's been here for a very long time. Uh, let's see, since before the 80s. So it's been here a really, really long time. It used to be initially, it was um, a little booth on, oh, down there where they're doing all the construction, Lower Sproul. And then they opened that store. I was in Kentucky, oh my gosh, when was this? I was in Kentucky in 1989 for my father-in-law's funeral, and the, the pastoral assistant who was a fresh, you know, he was fresh out of seminary came over to call on the family, and he walks in and says, oh, you're from Berkeley, I loved Yogurt Park. So even in Kentucky, Yogurt Park was the discussion. So Yogurt Park's making frozen yogurt. Let's think about this. What are the various inputs? I'm gonna make, you're gonna give me answers to call out. Don't call out any. Raise your hand so I can call on you. Sorry, heckling is bad. Call, raising your hand is good. Um, we're gonna make a list right now of the various inputs that are involved in frozen yogurt. So raise a hand and I'll call on you. Yeah, milk. All right, milk is one. What else? Right here. Sugar. Hallie. Rent. Yep, did you gotta pay for the building? 
Machines. Right there. Machines. Uh, here in the fourth row. Workers. Yep, because that frozen yogurt doesn't make itself. And even over there at Yogurtland, you may make your own frozen yogurt, but you still have a worker to take the money. And there's somebody behind the scene filling those boxes, those machines. Over here on the side. Cups and cones. Good. What else? Way in the back. Louder. Good. Electricity. What are the other inputs that we need for making frozen yogurt? Way in the back. M&Ms. Or more generally, we'll call them sprinkles. Or toppings. I guess toppings. Yes, right here. Spoons. All right, what else? I'm sorry, what was the answer, Frank? Oranges? And where, that's, is that a topping? Okay, so we already got toppings. So, so watch the list. Okay, over here, what else? Advertising. Good job. Advertising. I had a hand over here. Way in the back. Louder. Flavoring. Anything else? I forget anything important. Yep. Property? Like, underneath, yeah. Good. There we go. One more. Uh, time is not an input. What's the input? Time's not the input. What's the name of the input? Labor or workers. So we already had workers here someplace, which is another word for labor. Yep. Taxes. So we put taxes and licenses. Oh, dear. Is that right? C-E-N-S for license? We'll say that's right. All right, so we got a good list. We can go on, but we'll stop at that point. So we got this list of things that are inputs into the production of yogurt, frozen yogurt. When we think about production, the question we're going to ask is, how does the total output change when the variable in... Ooh, that's a strange circle, isn't it? When the variable input changes... There, that's better. When the variable input changes, we're going to have... We're going to simplify by saying there are two inputs. So we just came up with a list of about 14 inputs. We're going to simplify and say there's only two. One of those inputs is capital, and one of those inputs is land. The difference is that capital is the fixed input. Excuse me, labor. I said land. Two inputs, capital and labor. The capital is the, what we're going to call the fixed input, and the labor is the variable input. And what we mean here is as we change the amount of frozen yogurt being produced, there are some things, if we're increasing the amount of frozen yogurt that we're producing, there are some things where we need more of those inputs. Right? If we're going to sell 1,000 cups of yogurt in a day, we're going to need more of that milk than we do if we sell only four cups of frozen yogurt in a day. There are other things that, independent of how much we produce in a day, we're going to have the same amount. So we can't change in a day. We can't go in tomorrow morning and change the amount of some of those inputs. The ones that are fixed, where we can't change the quantity of that thing in any given day, those we're going to call capital. And the ones that are variable, those we're going to call labor. And we're going to assume, which is what I just said, that the capital can't be changed in the short run. That was that definition of short run. So let's go back to our list. There. Let's go back to our list and go through and figure out which of these things is capital, that is, it's fixed, the quantity that we're going to use doesn't change if we're selling four versus a thousand cups of yogurt in a day, and which of these things is labor, that is, the quantity of it changes. So milk, if we sell more frozen yogurt in a day, do we need more milk or no? Yeah. So we're going to call that L for labor, because that's our variable input. We're going to use L to stand for our variable input. Sugar, variable or fixed? Variable. So we're going to call that L for labor. Rent, the amount of rent that's paid for the space. Variable or fixed? Fixed. So we're going to call that K for capital. Machines, the number of machines in the shop. Variable or fixed? Fixed. So we're going to call that K, because we can't change the number of machines. If we're selling only four cups tomorrow instead of a thousand, we can't like throw away a machine. Workers, variable or fixed? Variable. Ah, I got some fixed and some variable. Put it this way. If it's big game day and you expect a whole lot of alumni who have this fondness for Yogurt Park to be walking by Yogurt Park and buying frozen yogurt on their way up to the big game, do you want to have the same number of workers there that you would have on the day after Thanksgiving when there's nobody in town? No. So workers is variable. That's something that you can change. You say we need to have extra shifts tomorrow because we got all those alumni coming to town. So workers are one of our variable input, we call it L for labor. Cups and cones, fixed or variable? Variable, so we call it L for labor. Electricity, fixed or variable? Var- most, a, lot, a chunk of it's going to be fixed because it's the lights, but the more often you pull that handle, right, the more electricity you're going to use. The more often you open the fridge to, re- to refill the machines, the more electricity you're going to use. So it winds up being a variable input. Sprinkles, fixed or variable? Spoons? Advertising. Tomorrow, the amount that's being spent on advertising tomorrow, is it going to change if there's only four people who come in to buy yogurt instead of a thousand people who come in to buy yogurt? Fixed. So you're going to make a decision today about how much you're spending on advertising tomorrow, and you can't change how much you're spending on advertising tomorrow depending upon how many people actually come into the shop. It doesn't affect how much you're spending on advertising. You bought those spots, you stuck with them. Flavors, fixed or variable? Variable. The, the property, I think that actually I wrote it down again, but it's really under here under rent, so we'll just put that back under K. Okay. Taxes and licenses. Hmm, maybe I should split those. Sales taxes, fixed or variable? Uh, business license, fixed or variable? Good. All right. So, so that's how we simplify. We take all of these many inputs, and we're going to divide them up into these two categories. One of them is capital, and one of them is labor. The capital is fixed, and the labor is variable. So now let's go to the next slide. Now let's look and see what happens to total output as we change the amount of workers. That is, as we change the amount of labor. Take a really simple example. Suppose that we have first zero workers. If we have no workers, we can't produce anything. So with zero workers, we get total product in that day. Suppose now we have one worker, and with one worker, we can produce 100 total cups of yogurt in a day. The marginal product of that worker, that is the change in total product divided by the change in labor, so how much additional product there is from that one additional worker, is a 100 minus zero, or 100 cups. So there's 100 additional 